Um, thank you, Noel, for those kind words of introduction. I would like to begin by thanking the organizers, especially Noel, for inviting me to deliver the third lecture in this series. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for giving me the honor of God lending uh, the statue of Mahatma Gandhi, an act in performing which I felt the same amalgam of emotions, ranging from admiration to reverence, which we Indians feel when we think of Mahatma Gandhi. The topic of my talk today is Mahatma Gandhi's solution for religious conflict. And what I'd like to say what I have to say in four parts. I'd like to begin by clarifying that when we use the term religious uh, conflict, uh, we do not necessarily mean any conflict in which the parties involved belong to different religions. In other words, there could be situations in which the parties involved belong to different religions, but the cause of the conflict is not religious. And in that sense, we probably should not call it a religious conflict. An example would be the Gulf War, uh, associated with the name of the American president, George Bush, uh, with Iraq under Saddam. Um, most of the parties on one side, most of the, well, the two parties, on the one side you had main, mainly Christians, and the other side Muslims. But that wasn't a religious conflict, yeah, because the cause of that conflict was rather political rather than religious. So we are addressing a situation in which the cause of the conflict is also religious. In fact, that is what makes it a religious conflict. So we have to discriminate in these situations between these two types of situations. Now, next I would like to identify four main uh, points one could derive from the study of Mahatma Gandhi's life and works on what might constitute Mahatma Gandhi's solution for religious conflict. Uh, conflict sorry. Now the first of these is that any such conflict should be resolved non-violently. A second uh, item could be that people should have religious freedom, the freedom to choose the religion they want to follow. The third is uh, more controversial. Gandhi was totally opposed to proselytization. And we will have more to say on this later. That is, he made a distinction between my choosing to follow any religion and somebody else asking me to follow somebody. This, this, this distinction is not always made in the discourse on these matters, and so it is important. And the fourth point we can derive from Mahatma Gandhi's life and thought is uh, his urging that we study the scriptures. Uh, excuse me. Okay, I think I should begin by asking that you heard what I said earlier. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, these are the four points I derived from the life and thought of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, but don't you feel this is very petty to I mean, anybody if asked to give us some principles for resolving uh, religious conflict is likely to say, well, we should try to resolve them non-violently. Everybody should, everybody should be free to choose their religion. I grant that the third one is more controversial, but even then we may have so I find supporters. Yeah. That uh, proselytization, when it is carried out, must be ethical. There should be no intimidation. There should be no allurement, etc. No running down of other religions. We we'll probably all agree with that. And finally, that people should study the scriptures of other religions. So I put it to you that uh, they are real. They acquire real significance. Not when we abstract that, and abstract these points from the life of and thought of Mahatma Gandhi. But when we locate them in the life and thought of Mahatma, how he actually, how it actually works out in his case, that's when we see the real significance of these points. So that leads me to the third part of my presentation. Now let us take the first one, the non-violent resolution of religious conflict. And let us see how it actually works out in the case of Mahatma Gandhi. So we had a situation of such uh, conflict uh, in the years leading up to the independence and partition of India in 1947, especially towards the end of 1946 and the early months of 1947. Uh, serious writing broke out in Bengal and Mahatma Gandhi, catching the importance of what was happening, arrived on the scene with his followers to try to do his best to stop it. This is his famous tale around Noakhali. Uh, on which much has been written. And one incident during this stay is what I would like to highlight in the context of our point of the non-violent resolution of religious conflict. In one of the villages, which was a Muslim majority village, during the disturbances, two swords were removed from a temple to the goddess, uh, the Devi, which belonged to the Hindus. So, now I, I should say something. Uh, by way of clarification before I proceed with the incident. There are several accounts of this, uh, and so uh, in my, there are different versions even of this incident. I am following the one with which I am most conversant with, which I think probably is the most detailed. So, one of Gandhi's followers, and her name was, her name is given, her name was Amtul Salam. She arrived in the village and urged the Muslim of the village, her co religionists to hand over the souls they had removed as a gesture of goodwill to the Hindus with whom they should live in peace. But they were in no mood to oblige her and they said, basically, who are you? Uh, so she said, well, if you won't do that, then I'll stop. We were not impressed. They said, you are not going to do any such thing. So then she said, if you don't respond in some way to 
my request and I'm going to stop drinking, taking water. Again, they were not impressed. So she basically lay down on a cart or a charpai on a bedstead in front of the masjid. Not taking either food or water. So the message was conveyed to Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi sent her a note, and I'm quoting the note exactly to you. Take water. Full stop. Give God time to work his miracle. On the 25th day, Mahatma Gandhi arrived in the village. And by that time, the villagers were to do anything to get her to stop fasting. So uh, they found one sword, which was a stone. They couldn't find the other. They signed a written agreement that they would produce an exact replica and hand it over to the Hindus. So here we have an actual illustration of how the first method of Mahatma Gandhi, which appears so dry when mentioned merely as a suggestion, takes on flesh. When you take up a real life situation. Mahatma Gandhi always believed that voluntary suffering is more eloquent than words. And that is what you have to undertake to convey your message. Let us turn to the second item, the religious freedom and the allied item of proselytization. Now on this point, I would like to read out to you an extended conversation which Mahatma Gandhi had with Charles Andrews. Those of us who have seen the film Mahatma Gandhi, uh, I think it's just called Gandhi, maybe, would probably recall a scene in which Mahatma Gandhi is about to launch his first major movement against the British. And Charlie Andrews says to him, what can we do to help? And basically Mahatma Gandhi says in American idiom, thanks but no thanks. That is, this is something we have to do by ourselves. So I'm narrating this to indicate how close the two were. When um, Charles Andrews first met Mahatma Gandhi in South Africa. He touched his feet. And there were notices in the uh, South African press about the appropriateness of a white man touching the feet of a black or brown guy. So, this con that is, he is talking to a friend. And, and now, this is how the conversation. Both are friends who are discussing this point. And this is how it proceeds. Andrews. What would you say to a man who, after considerable thought and prayer, said that he could not have his peace and salvation except by becoming a Christian? Gandhi. I would say, if a non-Christian say a Hindu, came to a Christian and made that statement, he should ask him to become a good Hindu rather than find goodness in change of faith. So what is basically as Gandhi is saying is, what you have to change is your, not your religion, but your life. Andrews. I cannot in this go the whole length with you. So you know my own position. I discarded the position that there is no salvation except through Christ long ago. But suppose in the Oxford Group movement, 
He was a good woman and a Christian woman, prominent woman of his time, like the evangelical movements now. But supposing the Oxford group movement people changed the life of your son and he felt like being converted, what would you say? Now let me digress for a minute. This is not a purely hypothetical question. This happened in Gandhi's life. His son became a Muslim. And Gandhi's comment on when he was told this is was keeping in mind. I hope he will be a good Muslim. So therefore Gandhi, Muslim, Hindu, Christian were in touch in evil terms. The constant was whether he's a good Hindu or Christian. Gandhi. And back to the text, I would say that the Oxford group may change the lives of as many as they like, but not their religion. They may draw their attention to the best in their respective religions and change their lives by asking them to live according to them. There came to me a man, the son of Raymond Vance, who said his reading of your book had led him to embrace Christianity. I asked him, if he thought that the religion of his forefathers was wrong. He said, no. Then I said, is there any difficulty about your accepting the Bible as one of the great religious books of the world and Christ as one of the great teachers? I said to him that you had never through your books asked Indians to take up the Bible and embrace Christianity and that he had misread your book. Unless, of course, your position is that of the late M. Muhammad Ali, that a believing Muslim, however bad his life, is better than a good Hindu. <laughs> Andrews, I do not accept Ali's position at all. But I do say that if a person really needs a change of faith, I should not stand in his way. Mm -hmm. But don't you see that you do not even give him a chance? You do not even cross-examine him. Supposing a Christian came to me and said, he was captivated by a reading of the Bhagavad, which as all of you know, is a well-known Hindu scripture, that he is captivated by a reading of the Bhagavad and so wanted to declare himself a Hindu, I should say to him, no. What the Bhagavad offers, the Bible also offers. You may not, I'm sorry, you have not yet made the attempt to find it out. Make the attempt and be a good Christian. Andrews, I don't know. If someone earnestly says that he will become a good Christian, I should say, you will become one. Do you know that I have in my own life strongly dissuaded ardent enthusiasts who came to me. I said to them, certainly not on my account will you do anything of this kind, but human nature does require a concrete faith. Mm. Yeah. If a person wants to believe in the Bible, let him say so. But why should he disregard his own religion? Yeah. This proselytization will mean no peace in the world. Religion is a very personal matter. We should, by living the life according to our lives, share the best with one another, thus adding to the sum total of human effort to reach God. End of Now, elsewhere, Gandhi is even more emphatic. He says that he would ban proselytization if he had dictatorial power. Now, the, um, some points to be kept in mind. Uh, when we 
for dealing with this, this common burden. He did, elsewhere again, he does say that if a person feels that he must change his religion, his or her own religion, on his own, his or her own, that he would not come in the way. But you can see Gandhi's reluctance to let people change their religion. It is as if, this will be my first comment, it is as if for him the, the spiritual economy of the world required that if it is not necessary to change, it is necessary not to change. And Gandhi felt that there was no need to change. <coughs> we will delve into this a little deeper. But let me make my second point, uh, really, this point. Um, this position of Gandhi is paradigmatic in modern Hinduism. I heard this from I heard this from the internet and you know as Probably we should approach any information gathered from the internet with some measure of skepticism. But it is in keeping with the tradition of the Ram Krishna mission uh, that what I am going to tell you about it uh, seems might be true, might be correct. Uh, it is said that the Ram Krishna mission in Spain has turned down 40,000 requests and be on part of people to convert to Hinduism. Because uh, Ramakrishna is famous for saying uh, he has many minds, so many parts, and that there is no need to change. But no really. The second point I would like to make is, or the second comment I would like to offer is, that whereas in, in some circles in modern Hinduism, this position is associated with the doctrine of karma. It is not so in the case of Gandhi. Now how is it associated with the doctrine of karma? Or how it may be associated with the doctrine of karma? Uh, is a point we need to pursue. Uh, it is the argument that you have been born in a particular family, which belongs to a particular religion because of your past sanskaras, the trajectory of your life, your spiritual life over several lives has brought you into the situation you are born in. Uh, it is currently induced, if not determined, and therefore it's not an accident. And therefore you should allow this dynamic to be worked out. The problem with the situation is that the same argument has been used to justify the caste system. Now, of course, you will also realize that it can only be used to justify the caste system if you believe in a static concept of karma. And the past invariably determines the present, and you have no karma, present karma, which of course is not the Hindu position. We have the whole concept of Kriyama and Karma, uh, what your action are performing now, also called Agama Karma. For Gandhi, the basic principle underlying his position is the equality of all religions, as equally efficacious in securing the spiritual good. And therefore, the absence of any need to move from one to the other. Now I come to the third part. Sorry, I covered second and third together. So I come to the fourth point I mentioned in the guidelines from Gandhi on how to resolve religious conflict. And that is the study of the scriptures of the world. 
the, that has recommended the study of uh, the scriptures of the world on the part of everybody. There's a very interesting passage on this. And, um, so let me share it with you. Slightly extended, but not too extended. I quote him now. I hold that it is the duty of every cultured man and woman, every cultured man, to be sympathetic the scriptures of the world. If we are to respect others' religions as we would have them to respect our own, a friendly study of the world's religions is a sacred duty really strong words. Every culture of man and woman, sympathetic, sympathetically or in a friendly way, <coughs> sacred duty. We need not dread upon our grown up children the influence of scriptures other than our own. We liberalize their outlook upon life by encouraging them to study free or that is clean. Fear there would be when someone reads his own scriptures to young people with the intention, secretly or openly, of converting them. He must then be biased in favor of his own scriptures. For myself, I regard, I regard my study of, or, or a reference of or the Bible, the Quran, and other scriptures to be wholly consistent with my claim to be a staunch Hindu. He is no staunch Hindu who is narrow, bigoted, and cons considers evil to be good if it has the sanction of antiquity and it is to be found supported in any Sanskrit book. I claim to be a staunch Hindu because Though I reject all that offends my moral sense, I find the Hindu scriptures to satisfy the needs of the soul. My respectful study of other religions has not abated my reverence for or my faith in the Hindu scriptures. They have indeed left their mark upon my understanding of the Hindu scriptures. They have broadened my view of life. They have enabled me to understand more clearly many an obscure passage in the Hindu scriptures. Now to put some flesh on these dry bones, <laughs> and we should study this scripture further. I'd like to uh, uh, recapitulate, because we already know this, the fundamentals of Gandhi Satyagraha. Basically, that you must fight injustice. We sometimes overlook this in our concern with non-violence. There was an equal insistence in Gandhi that you must fight injustice. And you might say, well, it appears to be injustice. And in, in Sanskrit, basically, the word for two doubles for justice. So you might say, you know, how do I know whether I am in the right? And so on. Gandhi was very clear on this. Whatever is proved to you at that moment is the truth. You can't dodge it. By saying, you know, in future what I'm acting differently. He quoted Confucius on this point. To know what is right and not to do it is covered. And adding, what is right is what at that moment you feel right. Your conscience tells you. Okay, so you must fight, but you must fight non violently. You have no enemies, you have only opponents. All opposition of Gandhi is in this sense royal opposition. And how do you fight? 
you undergo voluntary suffering. Till the other person recognizes, comes to a recognition of his or her own humanity through your voluntary suffering. These are the basic principles of Kavya and Satyagraha. And then the issue is resolved in a manner which leaves no trace of ill will and hatred. So this is genuine difference. Now, I want to go to your passage from a sacred scripture. I'm not going to tell you from where I got it, if I can find it here. <laughs> and then we will guess from where the statement might be. I quote the passage. The good deed and the evil deed are not alike. Repel the evil deed with one, one which is better. And lo, between whom and thee, while there was enmity, will become as though he was a bosom friend. But none is granted save those who are steadfast, agra. And none is granted it save the owner of great happiness. Namely, not everyone is able to practice such forgiveness. End of quote. Where do you think this text might be found? This passage is from the Quran. Surah 41, verses 34 and 35. This is as succinct a summary of the Satyagraha technique as any I have read. Okay, so that sort of concludes the third part. So we fleshed out uh, the basic guidelines to how actually in Gandhi's life they actually apply. And uh, they were, in a sense, case studies right? uh, of these points. And we see how the complexion changes when we actually contextualize them and Gandhi's life and thought. Now I come to the uh, fourth, uh, in the final part of my presentation, uh, in which I'd like to contrast uh, what is uh, our modern approach to religious conflict with the Gandhi in terms of three categories um, those of uh, religious identity, one of religious identity, the other of secularism, and the third of conversion. This is the modern approach to uh, religious conflict is basically enshrined in the <clears throat> 18th article of the UN Declaration. Everybody has freedom uh, to change one's religion or to ask somebody else to change one's religion. The free marketplace of ideas and everybody quote unquote advertises their goods and you know, people buy and sell. Right? 
And uh, you will notice that Article 18 uh, explains the provision by saying, and this freedom means the freedom to change one's religion. It doesn't use the expression to also to retain one's religion. And I'd like to uh, suggest that one reason for this might be that when in 1948 they were drafting this provision, they were basically working with the assumption, uh, assumption we associate with the world religion in the Western world, where it was done, which is that membership of a religion is exclusive. That is why you must change. And um, this kind of an understanding is a very Western one, uh, which also has another uh, ancillary implication. Namely, that because the main religion of the West, Hindu Christianity, is a missionary religion, no distinction is made between my freedom to change my religion and somebody else's freedom to ask me to change my religion. If you examine this closely, there are two distinct rights. My right to change my religion, which I think all of us would agree basically can be uh, a position with which very few of us will differ. And uh, who say this is the right that you should have. Everybody should be free to change their religion so long as they are not subject to any pressure, etc. So long it's a free choice. But, and in that sense, big upon in that sense it can be virtually unqualified. But my right to ask somebody else to change their religion could constitute, in my eagerness, an interference with the other person's freedom of religion. Somebody is in a mosque or a temple. And the Christian missionary goes in and says, no, 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 you are praying to a false god, and you must become a Christian. I mean, all of us would, uh, our intuitive ethical response would be, this is wrong. No? Christians are free to say that our God is true and yours is not true, but to go to this extent is not right. That is to say, we make a distinction here intuitively between my right, my freedom to change my religion, which is virtually unqualified. But when it comes to somebody else's freedom to ask me to change my religion, certain ethical norms have to be very carefully observed. Now, now we bring up the question of identity. What is going on here is that a distinction which Gandhi implies uh, is between exclusive religious uh, affiliation or exclusive religious identity and multiple religious identities has been overlooked in Western discourse. Now, uh, give you some examples of um, actual actual cases of multiple religious, first dual religious identity and then multiple, or again dual maybe but also in prime multiple. Well-known fact with anthropologists that if you go to Nepal and ask a Nepali, is he a Hindu? He will say yes. And if you ask him, is he a Buddhist? He will say yes. Very well-known fact. And uh, to anthropologists, and uh, Japan, regularly when the census is taken, 
to the census. The returns exceed the population of Japan. <laughs> With the result that 96% of the Japanese declared themselves <coughs> to be followers of Shinto, and 75%, 76% of the same population also declared itself a Buddhist. And then there are the numerous religious movements in Japan. You can also follow them. I'm not making this up. There is statistical evidence for this of Japan. So that one could even argue, a bit speculatively, that in pre-modern Asia, the dominant concept of religion was one of multiple religious identities. both in India, in China, and in Japan. My Chinese colleagues have warned me against uh, committing the mistake of thinking that because there are three teachings in China, you know, Sanjiao, uh, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism, that every Chinese had to choose among them. And he was either this or that. Just as when I first came, we did, started doing my graduate studies in religion, I was surprised to find that Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism are treated as separate religions in the Western academia. And when I pointed this out, they said, oh, you are just being an Indian. <laughs> okay, so this is the first point where you see uh, the significance of the Iranian position when compared to the modern. Uh, there is a different concept of religious identity operating, exclusive versus multiple. Uh, the second level is that of secularism. Now, Gandhi was totally opposed to a religious state. In the sense, uh, he was for a secular state in the sense that the state should have religion of its own. But, here comes the love. This is also the secular position. So what is the difference? The extreme secular position, let us call it the French, right? La Cité, uh, the, it would be that no religion can be a state religion but all, because all religions are false. The Enlightenment view. Gandhian position would say that no religion can be made the religion of the state because all religions are true. <laughs> Same outcome, very different logic underlying. So this in terms of secularism. And finally we come to conversion. An Indian scholar has for a distinction between what he calls vertical conversion and horizontal conversion. So the imagery here is that of uh, a mountain, mist shouted mountain because people don't know what the ultimate reality is. But we are all trying to go up the mountain, the spiritual hill. Uh, and from this point of view, if you change your religion, you are just going along the mountainside. It's a horizontal conversion. Instead of improving the quality, moral and spiritual quality of your life, which is, horizontal, which is vertical conversion. From this point of view, you can then say that what Gandhi was conceding was that if you really felt that only horizontal conversion will lead to your vertical conversion, then okay, you can change your religion. <laughs> so I should be concluding by now. Um, and I think what uh, you might say is that um, I'm this position basically in terms of how religion should relate us. But it is the wave that crash, not water. So these are specific form formations uh, about uh, what is right and what is true, you may have differences and so on. But what is right and what is true itself is in a sense beyond, beyond them. And what we should be really concerned about is water. In a sense, of course, water and waves are <laughs> And for Gandhi, that water was, <coughs> this is important, was morality. 
He says very clearly in his autobiography, religion is synonymous with morality. Thank you.